Hello, my name is Jeff Kinehart, and today we're going to be talking about successful transplant production. Why would a vegetable farmer want to use transplants? Transplants are commonly used in temperate climate areas like Illinois for several reasons. First, they allow growers to achieve a higher percentage germination from expensive seed. Some hybrid seed can cost as much as a dollar or more per seed, and it is critical for us to be economically successful that we achieve the maximum amount of germination from, some, from such high-priced seed. Additionally, by using transplants, we gain four to six weeks or even more on the growing season. If we set a tomato transplant in the field on May the 1st, or if we were to plant seed in the ground on May the 1st, it's likely that there would be as much as eight or 10 weeks difference when we harvested the first tomato. So by utilizing transplants, we get to harvest crop much more rapidly. Early yields for crops typically allow us to one, get a higher price in the marketplace. And secondly, they tend to be much easier to market. In other words, trying to sell tomatoes in June or July is much easier typically than trying to sell tomatoes in August. And by utilizing transplants, we get the earliest yield possible. Transplants can be produced in either hotbeds or greenhouses. Uh, at least typically those would be the most common places that they would be raised. A hotbed, like seen on the left, is typically a low-profile box with a slanted top that is skinned with glass or polycarbonate or other light-transmitting material, very similar to the way greenhouses might be covered. Thermostatically controlled heat cables are the most common heat source for hotbeds, although there are alternatives such as composting manure and or plant debris that can be utilized inside the hotbed to provide a heat source. Greenhouses are by far the most common method for transplant production and the, probably the most likely that you will be successful is by trying to produce transplants inside of the greenhouse environment. It is fairly common for new growers to sometimes try to raise transplants either in their house or in a heated garage and they try to supplement a little bit of window light by providing some additional fluorescent or incandescent lighting. And with very rare exception, this almost always ends either poorly or even disastrously. It's very difficult to raise transplants of much quality uh, without access to either a hotbed or a greenhouse. It's not that it can't be done, but it's just not very commonly achieved. And the first step in transplant production is normally going to be seed germination. And we're going to point out a couple of different things. If you look on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see something that would be typical of a tomato or a melon. And this is epigeous germination where the cotyledon actually comes from up out of the ground and is present on the newly developing transplant. There is another kind of germination called hypogeus where the cotyledon always stays below the ground. It's seen in the bottom left. The example there is a pea. We point out this difference simply to talk about this one problem that we see with seed germination. If you look in the upper right hand picture, that is a young tomato transplant and you can see that it has epigeus germination. The cotyledons have come up out of the ground and if you'll look, that seed coat is still hung on the top of the two cotyledons. This will happen some with most of the cucurbits. It will also happen with uh, tomato and pepper seedlings. And it really is a good idea to go back through and pick those off if you have the opportunity to do such so that the resulting stem that's going to be developing doesn't have to grow up through those folded up leaves. So. Look for hung on cotyledons and get them flicked off with your fingers or picked off if you can.
seed germination requires several factors to be met in order for it to occur. The seed being used must be viable with a living embryo. The seed must also be placed in an environment that has the proper water, temperature, oxygen, and light levels for the species being grown. And this does vary from species to species. The seed must be free from dormancy. And I think most of you will be purchasing seed, so dormancy issues will have already been addressed by the seed supplier. However, if you're saving your own seed, in some cases there are some specific post-harvesting practices that must occur in order for dormancy to be relieved so that that seed will properly germinate the coming year. Of the various environmental factors that we're going to try to control for good seed germination, probably temperature is the most problematic. The graph above shows the impact of temperature on seed germination. At optimum temperature, the percent seed germination is maximized and the days to emergence is minimized. As it gets warmer or colder than optimal temperature, the number of days required for emergence of all the seedlings that are going to germinate is lengthened and the percentage germination declines. So in other words, if we want to have a uniform crop of transplants, we want them to almost all of the seed emerge and we want them the seedlings to emerge over a one or two day period, not across a um, two or three week period. The only way we can achieve that is by germinating the seed at the proper temperature. And each species kind of has its own optimum temperature. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's a chart that shows kind of the optimum temperatures are indicated in the parentheses in red. Um, it shows you what kind of percent germination you achieve at various temperatures and the number of days it takes for the seedlings to emerge. And you can see there is a great difference. Uh, for example, if we go down the chart and we look at tomatoes uh, near the bottom of the chart, if we try to germinate tomato seed at 50 degrees, you know, we're only going to um, achieve a very low percentage of germination. You know, we're going to get 80, a little over 80% germination, and it's going to take 43 days for all the seedlings to emerge. And as we get to sort of the optimum, somewhere around 77 to 80 degree temperatures, we see that we get 97% of the seed is going to germinate and it only takes six days for all of the seedlings that are ever going to come up to actually start to grow and develop. So we get a much more uniform transplant production by utilizing optimum temperatures. Proper water and oxygen levels are also important for successful seed germination and these will largely be determined by the choice of media that the grower is using. Plug mix is the most commonly used for seed germination. Plug mix, or also sometimes sold as seed starter mix, is a media that is finer in texture than the growing media that is normally used for actually raising the transplant later in the production cycle. Plug mix helps ensure that we have good seed soil contact and for most crops, um, this is going to be the way that we're going to commonly germinate our seed. For a few crops like cucurbits, things like jiffy pellets seen in the right hand part of the slide here can be used. And in some cases, hydroponic growers may opt to use things like rock wool cubes that's seen in the bottom center of the slide here. But for most growers in a typical setting, you're going to use something called either plug mix or seed starter mix. And this is different than the growing media or, or typical potting soil. Again, if you're purchasing seed, you're not going to have to worry about dormancy in almost all cases. Uh, if you're saving back your own seed, there are some things uh, related to dormancy that we should be aware of. Um, if we have 
uh, if we're trying to save our own gourd seed, for example, in many cases they have a hard seed coat. So we might need to take a file or a piece of sandpaper and nick the seed coat so that we can get the seed to imbibe or take in water. We can have some cases where we have immature embryos and so we have to hold the seed after we've harvested it in a warm area so that the embryo inside of the seed can finish developing. In other cases, there are some internal physiological dormancies that occur, and in those cases, uh, we would be talking about a stratification period, meaning that you know we might take the seed that we've collected and place it inside of a plastic baggie with some moist sphagnum peat moss and throw it down in the crisper drawer of our refrigerator for uh, one or two months prior to trying to germinate the seed. Again, if you're using purchased seed, we really don't have any concerns with dormancy. Whatever is required has already been done by the seed company that's selling it to you. If you're trying to save your own seed, make sure you've read through and, and done a little bit of homework before you try to germinate those saved seeds and make sure you're not going to have an issue with dormancy depending on what the specific species is that you're raising. Growers vary in the seeding methods they use and in some cases the seeding method varies also with the species being raised. Small growers and also small seeded species tend to rely heavily on simply broadcasting seed on the top of the plug mix. This system works but the biggest problem associated with it is that diseases like damping off can proceed from plant to plant and result in, in death or mortality of the entire flat. Seeding in rows reduces the likelihood that the entire flat will be lost to disease. Growers that use plug trays or jiffy pellets or rock wool blocks and direct seed individual seeds into individual containers uh, absolutely reduce the amount of uh, risk from things like damping off. Here's an example of broadcasting and for really fine, really small seed, unless you have some very expensive specialized equipment, uh, this is going to be a pretty common practice. In some cases, if the seed is really fine, you can mix it with sand and broadcast that mixture of seed and sand across the flat so that we get a little bit more uniform disbursement of the individual seeds across the flat surface. But again, damping off, as we talked about earlier, can be a big problem. And you can see that in the bottom right hand slide. You can see that we've got um, one of the water mold organisms, whether it's Pythium or Rhizoctonia. You know, you can't tell. You can just see that the seedlings are damping off. And you can see that that's marching very rapidly across that entire flat. By using something like this seedling tray that you see here, where we have individual cells, it does two things. One, it does reduce the risk for damping off. It's pretty difficult for it to spread from chamber to chamber. It's not that it can't happen, but it's uh, a lot safer mechanism to do this rather than broadcast across a simple open 1020 flat. The other thing, particularly when you're starting out, typically we're going to have a few seeds of several different varieties that we're looking at, and these seedling trays really lend themselves well to that particular scenario. This is a plug tray, and this is very common amongst larger growers, less common amongst people that are just getting started or small growers. But in a plug tray, we have a single individual seed that is put into each individual hole, and these work exceptionally well. That's why large growers utilize them. But in general, they require uh, some fairly expensive specialized equipment to be in place um, for growers to do a very large number of seeds in this fashion. Here are some of the variety of seedling aids or tools that are available for small growers to help with seed dispersal or And again, direct seeding into plug trays while common in larger operations, it does require you know, typically having some sort of seeding aid so that we can get the seedlings uh, individually separated so that we're only dropping one seed per hole. 
there are some tools to help direct seating into plug trays. And if you look around uh, in the upper right would be the cheapest uh, sort of method of doing that. And that's going to be hooked to a vacuum cleaner. Um, in the bo bottom right hand side of the slide, you're looking at something called a wand seeder and it's hooked to a vacuum pump. We have individual needles that you can see in the insert of that picture. And depending on the size of the seed, we change the bore of the needle or the gauge of the needle that we're using so that we can get enough vacuum to hold the seed in place, but that the hole is small enough that we don't get doubles. We only have one seed occupying each of the needles. In the bottom left is what is utilized by larger commercial operations. Um, typically, it's going to be called a Blackmore needle seeder, although there are other companies that make these as well. And again, they work absolutely amazingly. I spent hours running, uh, but they're very expensive. Once we've got our seed in place, whether it's in a seedling tray or in a plug tray, whatever it is, the next thing that's going to, to be our concern is the germination process. As we discussed earlier, proper temperature and moisture are very critical for good seed germination. Larger operations will typically have an entire room. In many cases, it's a modified walk-in cooler where higher than average temperature and relative humidity are maintained for the germination process. Medium-sized growers may utilize purchased germinators like the one seen on the left-hand side of the slide here. Smaller growers typically utilize thermostatically controlled heat mats and cover flats with domes to maintain humidity like you see on the right. These are pretty commonplace and relatively economical to purchase. They're not, they're not particularly expensive. A couple of show uh, photos here showing you how some growers germinate seed. The lower left side shows the use of heating mats and they've built, rather than covering each individual flat, they've developed a cover there that they're able to cover the entire um, mat and all of the flats that are occupying that mat. The germination bench in the upper right hand is heated with electric heating cables. You can't see the heating cables. They're buried typically in sand that's put in the bottom of that bench. But again, we have a thermostat that controls the temperature that's being maintained in this germination area. The upper left hand slide here is, is showing you what a heat cable looks like. They're available in a wide variety of lengths and wattages. And we simply wind them underneath of the area that we're trying to going to use to uh, place our flats on that are going to be germinated. The right hand picture is an example of a thermostat that is used to control either heat mats or cables. The copper probe that you see coming out of that blue box on the right hand side is inserted into an empty flat or section of the flat that is filled with the same media and it is at the same degree of wetness as the rest of the flat being used to germinate seed. And then we plug our mat or heating cables into this and this kicks off and on uh, as required to maintain the temperature that we're looking for. Another tool that is critical is an accurate thermometer that can be inserted into the germination media. Uh, it sounds, you know, pretty simplistic, but, you know, you really do need to have uh, one of these pocket thermometers kind of similar to what might be carried around by a chef so that we can put it into the media and get an actual temperature of what's going on in the media itself not in the air above the media. Very soon after germination, the flats containing the seedlings should be moved out of the germination area and into the greenhouse. Failure to remove the seedlings from the germination area, which is at higher temperature and relative humidity, and most commonly also at lower light intensity, will result in stretching, or the horticultural word for that is etiolation of the seedlings. And once this has happened, you're almost guaranteed an inferior quality transplant is going to be produced. So we want to take and seed our flat. We want to put it on an area, typically a mat, that's going to be very warm. And as soon as that seed germinates, we want to get it off of that mat and back out to 
normal greenhouse environmental conditions where we've got you know 70 degree daytime temperatures and 60 or 65 degree nighttime temperatures. Usually about a week after the seedling has emerged, it's time for us to pot the seedling that has developed. There are a wide variety of containers that are used for growing transplants. The types of containers used will vary by growers and also by the species being raised. The size of the container must be large enough to support the finished transplant size. Growers should note that in a vast number of studies, there has been a correlation established between the size of the transplant being set and the amount of early and overall yield. In terms of materials, you know, we can grow transplants in plastic or clay or peat-based uh, peat containers. And for many crops, not all crops, but for many crops like tomatoes, the larger the transplant that we set in the field, the earlier that we're going to harvest fruit and the higher the yield is going to be overall. This is a study that shows the impact of tomato transplant size on early and total marketable yield. And you can look it up. There's, you know, the citing citation for that is, is at the top of the slide. And larger transplant size simply equals greater yield. That's just kind of the way it is. Plastic is the most commonly used material for growing transplants. It is economical, lightweight. It can be reused as long as we're sanitizing it between crops and available in almost any imaginable shape and size. The biggest problem with plastic, especially for new growers, is that plastic tends to stay wet and that can dramatically reduce um, the quality of the transplants that we raise. So is it used? Absolutely, it's used widely. But if you're going to use plastic, take extra care to not overwater your crop during the production cycle because it's very difficult to get plastic containers to dry out. Here's some other examples of, of plastic that would be used in transplant production. Clay, which was sort of the one of the standards for you know, better than 100 years has widely been phased out. Clay is seldom used anymore by commercial growers. It is very grower friendly. It is reusable and it is, assuming you bought unglazed clay pots, very easy to keep the media dried out in this, which helps us maintain a good environment and produce better quality transplants. However, clay pots are very expensive and they are very heavy and because of those two factors, you just very seldom see them utilized for commercial production anymore. The use of peak containers is increasing among growers. The peak containers, while not reusable, are relatively cheap, very grower friendly. They are very easy to keep dry, to, you know, to not have a problem with the media staying too wet while we're trying to raise our transplants. And they also are available in a wide variety of in shapes and sizes. You know, there's not as many choices for shape and size as there is for plastic, but they are so forgiving if you happen to overwater or you get a series of cloudy days uh, where we can get in real trouble with plastic containers. I'm quite a fan of, of raising transplants in, in peak containers. A variety of materials can be used for um, raising our transplants. There are a lot of different, we, we refer to it as media. Uh, you probably more commonly would call it, have called it potting soil. Um, typically, um, growers are going to purchase um, medias like you see 
We've got plug mix on the left hand side and as we get ready to pot, we're going to use um, stuff that is general purpose growing media like this pro mix that you see on the right hand side. And if we look at what's contained in modern potting soil is the word that we, you know, again, might use. We would prefer the word media um, because it'd be very you know, soil in modern potting soil. It's based on typically going to have some bark base to it as well as peat and perlite and vermiculite. In the case of Promix that you see here, which is probably one of the most commonly used materials, uh, it has been adjusted for uh, pH so that it's going to be the right pH for growing transplants in. And it generally does a good job of raising a wide number of species. You know, if you were raising some of the ornamentals, some of the uh, Calambrochia or the Million Bells, we might need to change the pH for it, but in general, uh, this stuff is good to go for most of the materials that you're going to use. And again, you know, it's got peat moss in it, it's got perlite, vermiculite, a little bit of limestone, and some wetting agent, and it also has some uh, fungal organisms that are kind of bio uh, fungicides and they help uh, establish better plant growth for our transplants. Once we've decided what container we were going to use and what media we're going to fill it in, it's now time to actually sort of uh, uh, move our seedlings up into larger transplant production containers. After filling the growing container with media, it's now time to transplant. For broadcast seed or seed sown in, sown in rows and seedling trays like we looked at earlier, the seedling will have to be pricked out and this is done typically using a pencil. And note how the grower is handling the transplant only by the cotyledons. Internet, it's a great source of, of humor for me. Here's a great picture. Uh, they didn't have the uh, big no insignia over the top of it. Do not handle seedlings by the stem. You can easily damage the growing point, which is at the very end of the stem, which can either result in simply a delayed or damaged transplant, or in many cases, it may result in uh, the seedling not growing anymore. So don't handle your transplants when you're, when you're pricking them out by the, or when you're moving them up by the stem. If you can avoid it, try to handle them by um, cotyledons or leaves rather than grabbing hold of the stem proper. This is really important on those newly emerged seedlings when you're first pricking them out and moving them up. Growers that have direct seeded into plug trays will often move those plug tray seedlings up into larger containers. To avoid damage to the plug plant, we typically are going to use something to dislodge that plug like the plug knocker that you see right here. Smaller growers can actually accomplish the same thing by simply finding a bolt that's the appropriate diameter to fit up through the bottom of the plug tray and pushing each of the individual plants out rather than grabbing hold of that stem and trying to yank them out uh, and again, possibly causing damage to the, to the plant. Once the transplants have been potted, they are grown on in a greenhouse environment typically. The left-hand picture shows a well-planned greenhouse that can be watered so that all the plants are receiving the amount of water that they need. The picture on the right, I think, represents uh, some, some problems that we should talk about. You know, try to keep your plants of similar species, similar size, grouped together on the bench. On the right, we have got so many different types of plants in a very small area. It will be difficult or probably more likely, even impossible, that we are able to do a good job and not have some of the plants being overwatered and some of the plants being underwatered if we have a situation like seen on the upper right-hand side. Keep your stuff grouped together by size so that we can go in and water and keep everything uniform. Successful transplant 
growing requires several factors. First and foremost, let's water the plants only when they need it. Far more plants are killed or delayed or lessened in quality by overwatering than by underwatering. Most growers use soilless media, which have little or no micro con micronutrient content. So growers should start applying fertilizer on a weekly basis on the second or third week of transplant growing. It is important to maintain proper temperature and good air circulation in the area where we're raising our transplants. And this may help to reduce diseases and will result in the production of higher quality transplants. Good light quality is also important to avoid stretching and to hasten plant growth and development. Proper plant spacing is also required. If too many plants are grown in too small of an area so that they are too close together, this will always result in the plants stretching and gives rise to very poor quality transplants that you know, simply don't perform better just because you put them out in the field. We said that typically we're not going to have any micronutrients in the potting soil or the media that we're going to be using. And so we're going to have to start fertilizing fairly early on in crop production. Most growers are going to use a water soluble fertilizer uh, in their transplant production. Organic producers might use fish emulsion or other suitable fertilizer forms. The water soluble fertilizer is typically injected into the irrigation water so that as we are watering the crop, we're fertilizing it at the same time. The picture in the upper right shows a proportional injector that typically costs between $250 and $400. They are very precise and they are um, most commonly adjustable, although there are some that are fixed. They normally operate somewhere in the vicinity of uh, injecting at the rate of 100 to 1. So if you'll look in that upper right hand picture at that injector, we have a stock tank or five gallon bucket in this case that is below the injector. For every 100 gallons, it's going to come out the garden hose and be applied to the crop in the greenhouse. One gallon of the concentrated fertilizer solution is going to be sucked up and injected. So it's injecting at a rate of 100 to 1. Um, the bottom right shows a cheaper method of kind of accomplishing the same thing. Um, not exactly the same, but it might be more appropriate for people that are just getting started that have very finite access to capital in the very beginning. And this is using a, uh, a siphoning or type of an injector. And, you know, these are going to be relatively cheap. They're going to cost 30 or 40 bucks. The problem with them is that they're not as consistent in their application rate as what the proportional injector is. Well, that's one of the problems. And the second problem is that they don't inject at such concentrations that it requires a lot of stock solution to be made. You know, these are normally going to operate somewhere in the neighborhood of 22, 28, 30 to 1, something like that. So for every 30 gallon that we actually water out in the greenhouse, it's going to take a gallon of, of stock solution in the bucket that you see there. So there's a lot more mixing involved with this type of system, but it will absolutely work and it is a way to uh, get started without having to go in the hole on an expensive injector. But as your operation flourishes and develops, I would sort of move to a proportional injector sooner rather than later. And this is just sort of the label of what you would find in, uh, you know, a good um, water soluble fertilizer. In this case, it's the label from the Scotch 2020 20 that we looked at in the previous slide. But I put it in here only to show you that we're not just getting nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but this fertilizer also has the trace elements or the micronutrients that are also required for plant growth. You can see we've got boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, zinc. Um, and if we don't apply these through some type of fertilizer during the transplant production cycle, it is common that we will see nutritional deficiencies develop in the crop somewhere around week four. Maintaining proper temperature is also mandatory for the production of high quality transplants. 
this table and there are a lot of them that can be found from a whole lot of different sources lists sort of the optimal day and nighttime temperatures running daytime temperatures far in excess of those listed or night temperatures far below those listed will almost always result in lower transplant quality. Here's two tomato transplants. The transplant on the right, while shorter, is actually probably a better quality transplant. The lack of stretching in this transplant on the right means that it will have higher survivability and typically suffer less transplant shock when we actually go out and set it in the field. So even though the one on the left looks bigger, it's probably not really as good of a transplant as the one on the right. The one on the left was grown probably with more water, more fertilizer, warmer temperatures. The one on the right was grown in a drier, cooler greenhouse uh, and, and will have superior results when moved out into the field. Here are two examples of poor quality transplants. The upper picture is showing plants that have weak stems and poor colors. They are obviously lacking phosphorus and one would suspect that the plants would have likely been grown too cold. The bottom flat shows stretched plants and these were grown probably too warm and too wet. Uh, so we don't want too cold or too hot. We want the right temperature and the right moisture. Good quality tomato transplants are nearly uh, a cube, meaning that they are almost equal in terms of their height and their width. So again, successful transplant production is the product of many different factors, and those include things like good sanitation, good light quality and quantity, and maintaining proper temperatures in the growing environment. Sanitation. Sanitation is something that cannot, should not be overlooked. We want to start with clean certified seed, disinfest all tools and containers that are going to be reused, and also the greenhouse benches and that growing environment where the plants will be raised. Keep water wands and breakers off of the ground. If we've got garbage cans out in the greenhouse, they should have a lid on them. We go through the greenhouse and you know this plant looks really sick we pluck it out of the mix and we throw it over in the garbage can if we don't put a lid on that you know it's possible for aphids to come in feed on the spent culls then turn around and reinfect the crop that we're trying to raise so i don't have a problem with you having a garbage can out there in the greenhouse but keep a lid on it keep weeds out of the greenhouse they can harbor insect pests and disease problems if growers are using soil based rather than soilless media, it is best that we also have some steam pasteurization occurring proper to or prior to uh, using the materials. Although not commonplace, there are growers that use soil blocking for transplant production. Reasons for using soil blocks include you know, a better root environment, more air circulation, less pruning, improved water holding capacity, reduced incidence of transplant shock, usually can remain in flats for a longer period of time than if we were using um, plug or cell based systems, and less waste. If we're growing them in soil blocks, we have, you know, less plastic that we're going to be uh, having to get rid of. Here are some examples of tools used to make soil blocks and tomato transplants being grown in soil blocks. So this method works, works well. Um, again, it's not commonplace, but you definitely see it in Illinois. And for growers that learn how to do it, they are very good at growing transplants using this method. Here's the pictures of soil blocks that are pre-dibbled and ready for direct seeding. And by using various sizes of soil blockers, you know, they have systems in place where the pre-dibbled seedling one that you saw before fits into the next size up like you see right here. It's almost like a lock and key and we can move up these plug plants.
when we soil block, you know, we don't normally just go out to the edge of the field and stick this down in it. We have a mix that we make ourselves for soil blocking. And here is an example of one of the soil block mixes that can be used. Uh, three buckets of peat moss, half cup of lime, two buckets of perlite, three cups of fertilizer mix, one bucket of field soil, two buckets of compost. And we go through and mix this material and we can either steam pasteurize it or not. Um, but once that's done, then we come in and wet it up, get it at the correct temperature so that it will hold the shape of the block well. And we use our soil blocking tool to make the soil blocks we're going to raise our plants in. There are lots of different organic transplant mixes that can be used. And, you know, I'm not going to go through and, and read you all the materials, but Here's kind of the recipe for um, an organic transplant mix and all of the materials that you see listed here are allowed underneath of the uh, OMRI or Organic Material Registration Index. If you don't want to make your own, there are also many manufactured sources of organic growing media uh, that growers can simply um, purchase and, and use and still maintain that they've produced organic transplants. Many growers find themselves with leftover seed. How long we can save seed varies from species to species. Seed that is saved for use the following year should be stored in an area that is relatively cool and dry. Um, many growers may store them in a refrigerator. The length of time seed can be stored and the optimal storage conditions can be found from several different sources. One of the most common ones is something known as the Knott's Vegetable Grower Handbook. But when we store seed, we normally would like to see the sum of the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity should be near 80 degrees. So something like 40 degree temperatures and 40% uh, relative humidity are good storage conditions for most seed. Although, again, you know, consult a, a site that talks about um, optimal seed storage conditions and make sure you're accommodating the specific species that you're trying to. It is common for growers to face pest and disease problems that will need to be managed. Common insect pests that can occur in the greenhouse during transplant production would include aphids and thrips. Slugs can also occasionally be a problem. While insects and slugs can be addressed with pesticides, both conventional and organic growers will utilize this method. Virus diseases are more difficult to address and they are best addressed by using virus-free seed stock and varieties that are virus resistant. There are not good sprays that work to address viral problems. And, and we can really see a lot of viral problems, particularly on some of the heirloom tomatoes. So, you know, watch and if you think you've got seedlings that have got virus in them, you know, we need to get them rogued out and put into that garbage can. And remember, oh yes, put that garbage can uh, such that it's got a lid on it when we get our uh, rogued plants placed into it. Thrips can be a major greenhouse pest and they not only cause damage by feeding on the plants, but they can also transmit disease while they are feeding. Their management requires great diligence and often requires more than a single pest control method for successful management of the pest. So in other words, we might use something like uh, Botanigard as a, a pesticide spray but in addition to that, we may also be utilizing some predatory mites that feed on thrips. So, you know, be diligent and always be out scouting your crop, looking for problems and address your problems as soon as you find them. Although there are many diseases that can be problematic for growers raising transplants, the most common ones are listed above. 
Damping off or water molds and botrytis can be common problems in the greenhouse. Occasionally, Phytophthora can also be a problem. The first line of defense a grower should rely on is maintaining a good environment that is less favorable for the development of these diseases and practicing good sanitation. The greenhouse should be kept at proper temperatures and not have excessive moisture and humidity. These good cultural practices will go far in controlling disease problems. Additionally, there are both organic and synthetic pesticides that can be utilized to aid in the control of greenhouse diseases should they develop. When diseases do occur, growers should consider roguing affected plants and moving adjacent plants to a quarantine area to observe them to see if further disease development is going to occur. This can help stop outbreaks from eliminating or destroying entire greenhouses full of plants. Good disease, re good disease control requires growers maintain good cultural practices and may also require treatment with uh, organic or synthetic fung fungicides. Some of the things that we can do, for example, for damping off in terms of prevention, we want to practice good sanitation, have good air circulation, even watering and use soilless media, or if we're using soil-based media, making sure that we steam pasteurize it prior to using it. Once we have done everything we can on the prevention side of things and we still have a problem, then we're looking at some sorts of treatment actions that must be required. We may be looking at fungicide sprays, or we may be looking at uh, roguing quarantine uh, of adjacent plants and, and other types of physical activities to address disease problems. Well, we have gone through all the way from seeding to producing our transplant, and now it's time to set it in the field. And we're talking about field planting now. Um, prior to field planting, plants should be allowed to harden off. While historically this involved placing plants on wagons that could be rolled in and out of a machine shed or other building, this often occurs inside of greenhouses now since many of our greenhouses have sides that can be completely opened up and allow air circulation throughout the entire greenhouse. This process should begin by reducing the frequency of watering and allowing the plants to become exposed to some light winds. The harding, hardening off period can vary from a couple of days to a week or more depending on what practices the grower use, is using and just how soft the transplants were at the beginning of the hardening off process. Plants that are hardened off may have better survivability and be much less subject to transplant stress. Other considerations at field planting time should include selecting only the healthiest transplants and setting them at the appropriate time. Care should be taken to make sure that the newly set transplants have good root soil contact and normally plants are watered in immediately after setting. For many crops it is also common that the water used for this watering in of the transplant contain water soluble fertilizer typically referred to as starter solution. Following these steps may also help improve transplant survival, reduce transplant shock, and get your transplants to a uh, faster start. There are many types of machines that can be used for transplanting, such as the water wheel setter pictured above. A water wheel setter and most other types of mechanical transplanters allow for the application of water and plant starter fertilizer immediately at the time of transplanting. There are devices for both bare ground and plastic culture growing systems. The use of tractor drawn mechanical equipment does require that beds be laid out so that the tractor can be driven over the beds and also so that the conditions at planting time are dry enough to allow for tractor operation in the field. When we, need, when we need to set the plants. Smaller growers are often going to start out by transplanting by hand, 
but even in those cases there are some pieces of equipment that can help speed the process uh, here are some examples of some hole marking equipment that can be actually pulled through the field by hand but it makes dibbles or shows spots where we can go back in and then and field set our plant the equipment marks where the plants are to be set allowing for uniform plant spacing without the need for a tape measure Hand planting is more suitable for smaller plantings and does not require that the field be dry enough for tractor operation. Uneven rows and oddly shaped fields are not a problem for growers planting by hand and they can be quite difficult to address if we're trying to use tractor drawn equipment. Here are some additional aids for hand planting. Field planting works best with straight rows and the row spacing, both the in row and the between row spacing, should be appropriate for the crop being raised. Transplants should be set at proper depth and the field should be soil sampled and amended as required prior to planting. Some growers may use row covers, particularly on early plantings. Row covers can be used to provide a slight degree of frost protection and they can also help reduce some of the insect problems for some specific crops. As in most endeavors, success occurs when preparation meets opportunity. That means planning is a critical part of the successful venture. We must be sure we have a sufficient variety of crops across the time period our customers are wanting to purchase. To spread the harvest of any one crop, growers can use two strategies. First, they can select early, mid, and late season varieties of a particular crop. Additionally, they can make successive plantings to spread out their harvest. Planting considerations include when do I want to plant? How long does it take to make the transplant? How many plants am I going to need? And how many plantings am I going to make? The first year, this will largely be a guess on the part of the new grower. It is critical that growers keep good records, you know, good journals and a calendar so that the following year they can capitalize on success and minimize repeating mistakes that were made in year one. In some cases, such as CSAs, the growers may have a fairly certain idea of the amount of produce that they need to have available for market across the entire growing season. In those cases, planning can be done a bit more precisely and we can do it such to meet the market demands. And on this slide right here it, it, it goes through the process of how we would go about determining exactly how much we need to plant each week for us to be successful in our marketing endeavor. Tools for crop planning can be created by the grower or they may wish to use existing software programs or in some cases there are apps available to help. The use of planning tools does not alleviate the need for good record keeping because we can go back and look at those good records that we have kept and make much better use of whatever the planning tools are that we plan to uh, help us with our operation. Here are a list of some additional resources that are available uh, and they'll talk about uh, um, everything from diseases to uh, planning uh, apps and, and materials that are available for small market gardens. And again, here's some additional list of resources as well. Happy transplanting. Uh, if you have questions, there's a couple of websites that you can visit. Or you can contact any of us and we'll do our best to answer any questions that you may have. Good luck with your transplant productions. And until next time, goodbye.